Well, it's a good thing we surrender, I guess. You do remember our surrender. It happened back in the 90s. You know, the war started back in the 60s. The war on poverty. Remember that? Our nation was going to rise to the challenge and eradicate poverty. We fought gallantly. And William Jefferson Clinton, he signed the uh, armistice that ended that war in the 90s. May as well, you heard Jesus, poor are always going to be with you. So, give up. Why should we try? Right? Well, of course not. We're Christians. We believe in charity. We believe the battle should go on. But the thing is, even though we have so much enmity and hatred towards Judas Iscariot, we follow his methodology for charity. Why wasn't this costly perfume sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? You know, just shovel money at the poor and hope that the problem takes care of itself. And we do that in the church. St. Mary's is pretty good at not doing that, but for the large part, we do that. And one of the things I remember from being on the front line in the war on poverty, working for the state of Tennessee as an eligibility counselor for AFDC and food stamps, every time an able-bodied person came in there and I gave them money or food stamps, they paid dearly with their dignity. And that's not to say that there were elderly people and disabled people that need the assistance of society. That's true. That's always going to be true. But the thing that really got me was those folks got maybe 10% of what the able-bodied people got. That was during the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 19... I'm going to give myself away if I say that, aren't I? Uh, in the 1980s. It was Ronald Reagan's first Omnibus Reconciliation Act. So what are we to do? Amy McNamara dropped off a book for me to look over called Toxic Charity. <laughs> How churches and charities hurt those they help. And one of the things they talk about in here are these mission trips. And I know that there have been mission trips. Well, we tried to take one from St. Mary's. Got snowed out, right? Uh, but uh, Mr. Lupton, he says that mission trips often do more damage than good. And he cites, why? Somebody say why? Yeah, good. I said why. All right, somebody said why. I said why. Good. I like that. <laughs> Well, this is why. He, he cites a mission trip that was taken by a church to retile a facility in Cuba. And of course, all of these kids, because it was a youth group, and even the adults that went with them, didn't know the first thing about laying tile. They didn't know how to do grouting. You know, the lines zigzagged and everything. So the supervisor of the job was very patient with them and they took a week. And the problem with that was sitting right outside the gate of this facility were unemployed tile workers. Wondering if there might be a few scraps left over after this mission trip got through. That's, that's how charity can be toxic. But what he does, he's not completely negative. He talks about the oath for compassionate service. And he has a good plan here. He says this is what churches and others should do. They should take this oath before we engage in charity, what we call charity. Never do for the poor what they have or could have the capacity to do for themselves. Um, limit one-way giving to emergency situations. Don't shovel money at the problem. That's not the answer. Now here's the key. Strive to empower the poor through employment, lending, and investing, using grants sparingly to reinforce achievements. Now, I'm going to stop right there a minute because something happened Friday night that just caused me to 
seize up almost. I was at uh, the food bank dinner where they recognized Tom Law. You know Tom Law? A lot of you may not, a lot of you may. He comes to the 8 o'clock service. They were recognizing him for many years of service to the Westchester Food Bank. And one of the executives of the food bank got up and said, um, I was going through the checkout line at the a and I was on my way home, wrapped a rotisserie chicken. I was tired. I didn't want to fix dinner. So, you know, I did the rotisserie chicken thing, and I was going through the checkout, and the woman noticed that I had a little badge, or I was wearing my badge, that said, you know, food, food pantry. And she said, can you help me? Can you help me, an employee person in this country? Can you help me? What is wrong with that picture? And, you know, I looked at the stats in, in the book they handed out, the little booklet. Oh, it turns out that I think something like 41% of the people that use the services at the food bank have at least one person that is employed full time. There's a moral failing here. There's a moral failing. And it's not just yours, it's mine. It's all of our failing. How can that happen? What's happened to a living wage in this country that brings with it dignity? And not just dignity, the ability to borrow, the ability to invest, the ability to participate fully in society and in community. That's eradicating poverty. That's where the war on poverty should be fought. Something happened to the plumbing of trickle-down economics. There's a clog somewhere. And I'll tell you what the problem is. This country has a value of wealth assessed at $57 trillion. That seems like a lot. Out of that $57 trillion, 47% of it is controlled by 1% of this population. You don't have to believe me, Google it. It's common knowledge. I've failed. I've lost this war. Greed, arrogance, it's taken over. So what can we do? Oh, wait a minute. Now, see, I'm going to take a risk here, and I can get shot at for being political, okay? But we do live in a country that prides itself on being run by who? The who? The people. Of the? United States. Of the people? For the people, not the few. So who's responsible for the situation we're in now? The people. The Judas method of charity will only perpetuate destructive cycles of poverty. Shovel money at it. And what I'm hearing in this economy, political system today is let the churches take care of it. We're having trouble taking care of ourselves. And we don't have the organization or the structure to really deal with the number of people that are just on disability relief in this country. That number's huge. Do we care? Do we? I kind of digressed a bit on that last point. Anyway, that was strive to empower the poor through employment. And I'll add to that employment with a living wage. I think we need to be clear there. 
subordinate self-interest to the needs of those being served. That goes back to the mission trip thing. Listen closely to those you seek to help, especially to what is not being said. Unspoken feelings may contain essential clues to effective service. Because one thing, he goes on in here and he talks about if there's a single mother who is also working and she needs to take her child to a clinic, even a free clinic, when are those usually open? Working hours. <laughs> and what's going to happen to somebody that's working poor that has to take time off to take care of a kid? They're going to lose their job. They're not going to have the type of job security that other people with higher levels of income will have. Well, yeah, if you have more than one kid that's sick, you're really up the creek. So that person who's receiving benefits from this charity-minded organization is not likely to say, you know, if your hours were from 6 to 10 in the evenings, that would probably help us out a lot better. They're not going to say that because they might just lose those services too. That's what the poor are used to. And the final thing sums it all up. Above all, do no harm. <laughs> well, I wish it was easy. You know, I wish that we could just take up that collection plate, grab 10% out of it, and just toss it out the door and say, here poor and use the old Judas Iscariot method of dealing with poverty. But no, poverty requires a strong commitment from you and me to be willing to build community. That's the only way we're going to get rid of poverty is through community and empowering others by inviting them into an economic process that has $57 trillion of wealth, inviting them into that process as full partners and participants. You know, just to me, that sounds like the Christian thing to do.